We are recording the interview of David Morris. This interview is being conducted by David Berry from the collaborated efforts of the Wright State University Veteran Forces Project and the Raytheon Company. This interview is being recorded at the Arlington Towers Building in Washington, D.C. It is 11 a.m. on November 4th, 2017. So why don't we begin, Dave, with uh, where and when were you born? I was born in uh, uh, May, uh, May 27th, 1982, and uh, I was born in, uh, well, actually, Lackland Air Force Base uh, in Texas. And uh, who were your parents, and what were their occupations? Um, my parents are uh, Earl Morse and Clarice Morse. Um, my dad, he was, uh, he was in the Air Force at the time. And uh, my mom, she she was kind of doing um, part-time jobs, uh, and also a stay-at-home mom. What about uh, who are your siblings? I have one sibling, um, my brother Patrick. And what did your brother do? Um, I mean, he's he works for uh, the government now. Uh, he's uh, project manager uh, for the federal government just top secret type stuff <laughs> I, don't know. Oh, I ask him all the time and yeah he, he's only allowed to give like so much information but yeah he's it's pretty important okay did uh, did he have did he join the military at all or was it just no him? no yeah he never joined the military he uh, went uh, went from high school straight into college and uh, then from there um, he worked some like odd end jobs and um, eventually got into a really cool program that allowed him to get his master's and then eventually get into the uh, government position. So yeah, very proud of him. He did awesome. Uh, so uh, let's get back to you. What were you doing before you uh, joined the military? Uh, before I joined the military, I um, barely got through high school. <laughs> I wasn't, uh, wasn't a very good student. But uh, I got through high school and then went to work. Um, that's my aspirations were to uh, graduate high school and then just be a blue collar worker. So I started working. Uh, first, it was just enough jobs. I think I had like three jobs at the time just so I could get out of my house. I really just wanted to get out of my house. And so I saved up enough money, I got out of the house and then moved to North Carolina uh, where I was gonna or I was part of a band and we were gonna be famous and tour all over the place and uh, you, see, well, you see how well that worked. Um, but uh, I eventually uh, just started working for uh, warehouses um, and that kind of thing, just odd end jobs, uh, trying to make it as a struggling musician and um, a blue collar worker, factory type worker. So I got it. What was the name of your band? Who? Uh, there was a couple. Uh, it was one of them was Mad Push, and the other one was uh, started off as No Cash Value, and then another band that was called No Cash Value was threatening to sue us. So then we had to change it to uh, Braving the Change. Oh, yeah, the change. That, that was actually a pretty good band. I liked that band, but. Um, I mean, all of those end up breaking up at some point, and yeah. Uh, the, actually, one of the reasons why the uh, what Braving the Change, one of the reasons why they broke up is because one of the key members decided to join the Air Force. Yeah. So. Uh, what kind of music was it, and what instrument did you play? I, I play drums. Um, I play other instruments though, as well. But uh, my my instrument, I played drums since I was like 13 years old. So uh, I was, I'm decent at drums and that's what I played for these bands. And um, yeah, I just played that and um, I, was, I played that, it was punk rock. Uh, and then once we turned to Brave and the Change, we kind of became that emo slash screamo. Um, when I had hair, uh, did the whole emo thing, whatever. And uh, yeah, I was like the drummer slash screamer. Um, did it all, man. It was, it was fun. 
Uh, so let, let, let's go back and uh, shift gears back into your military experience. So which branch of the military did you join? Uh, I enlisted into the uh, Air Force, and I was finally accepted the second time. The second time? Right, yeah. So <clears throat> the there was a first attempt, and this was like right after high school. Um, I went there, tried to get in, and the Air Force said, no, uh, we're not going to accept you because I had a, uh, I blew out my knee um, playing football, an old football injury. So uh, this was, of course, before September 11th, so there was no, like, real big push for military um, at that point. So they were like, no, um, you know, you, you sustained an injury, the Air we don't want the potential that you're going to get in and then uh, we're going to irritate that injury, whatever. Uh, so they said no. And uh, oddly enough, I, I don't know. My, so my dad was Air Force. My grandfather was Air Force. So I, I think realistically um, there wasn't really another option for me. It was just kind of a, um, a thing – and just my process at that time was the only option for me was Air Force, and if I couldn't go Air Force, I wasn't going to go anything else. I, I, f I the idea of joining another branch ki was kind of there for a little bit, but I think I was just so hurt over the fact that I couldn't get in. I was just like, you know what? I'll just I'll just go into the civilian world and and do my thing, and then that's when pursued the band and everything else. But. Uh, then September 11th happened, and uh, you know, a uh, few years down the road, um, in, in between, you know, recruiters were calling me and stuff like that. But uh, eventually, um, after I got married and everything else, uh, realizing that I had to do something a little more serious than band and um, odd end jobs, uh, I finally talked to a recruiter seriously, and this was in North Carolina. And um, decided to enlist at that point. So family was a big reason for your reasoning to join. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. So the it was just me and my wife at the time. But yeah. So the being able to have something sustainable um, for the potential of um, us growing into a family. Yeah. That was that was the reason why I joined, um, or attempted to join, and, and eventually ended up joining the second time. So uh, why don't we start with like your early days? So tell me, tell me about how it looked like leaving for basic training. What what did your family think? Oh, my parents they were they were ecstatic. Um, they were they were happy that I was getting in, and um, they they always figured I'd be great for the Air Force. Um, uh, at this point, I'd already, you know, pierced my ears and got tattoos, so they, they're, they're like, yeah, you, you need some, uh, uh, some control in your life or, you know, somebody hit you with a stick or something, I don't know. But uh, my wife, she, she, was, she was happy about it as well. She, uh, she knew that, she, I've known her since I was like 14 or 15. Uh, she knew that I had a desire to be in the Air Force as well. So um, everybody was happy. Uh, yeah, so I, I, was, I was confident. Uh, I had to wait a little bit before I actually was going into uh, basic training. I think I had to wait like three months. I had to lose a lot of weight. Um, I never was a skinny guy. So I started running uh, to prepare for basic training. I had to run like um, two miles a day. I start, stopped eating carbs, passed out on the treadmill once. That didn't go over very well. Um, uh, but ended up losing the weight that I needed to And um, by the time I was supposed to go to basic. so. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I was, I was heavily motivated to get in there. Um, and I knew what was coming. Talked to my dad. Uh, being a military brat, I, I mean, <laughs> I wasn't afraid of instru you know, the TIs or, or whatever. I wasn't afraid of any of them because I figured, growing up with my dad, um, the his his militaristic uh, way that he raised us uh, had to be very similar to basic training, and I, I figured, you know, 
I've been yelled at a few times uh, and punished uh, a few times, and um, I wasn't afraid of what a TI was going to say or do. It was just going to be like, yeah, this is going to be a breeze. And and realistically, I it was. Uh, when I went in and went through basic training, I was like, you're tiny, man, and you're, <laughs> you're not as intimidating as my dad. <laughs> it, was, it was actually quite funny. So outside of your kind of past or how your dad raised you, was there anything that your dad specifically told you that either helped you get through or helped motivate you? Yeah. Um, that what the main advice that he told me that really helped me was he said, don't try to be somebody. He said, keep your head down and just blend in. Uh, you don't want to be anybody during basic training and tech school. He said, just blend in once you get out of there then you can you know then you can shine and, and try to be somebody but uh basic training isn't about uh being somebody he said just keep your head down and blend in and that's what i that's what i tried to do and it worked yeah got me through there did he give you the whole don't volunteer for anything because it's a trap right yeah yeah don't yeah don't raise your hand <laughs> yeah don't be that guy yeah uh absolutely but yeah I mean, so were you, uh, let's move on uh, past basic training. Uh, where'd you go next? Um, I went to tech school. Uh, that was at, uh, it was a long distance away. Uh, I traveled all the way to Shepard Air Force Base, uh, which is uh, there in Texas still. Uh, so I went from uh, Lackland, which is in San Antonio, to Shepard Air Force Base, which is, um, I can't think of the name of the city, but uh, I think it's Wichita Falls, Texas, maybe? Yeah, Wichita Falls, Texas. Yeah, yeah, it is, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the armpit of Texas. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, it was just, oh, man. It was interesting, very interesting. Um, went there, I had, uh, I think it was like, I can't remember how long my tech school was, but I was a... Uh, a weapons loader for the F-16, uh, so I had to learn how learn all about munitions, um, and then learn about how to load them. And we learned all different types of jobs. Uh, so there are three-man crews. You learned how to be a one-man, two-man, three-man, and, and all the different uh, requirements uh, for the, those each individual uh, positions. And then when it was when it was time, um, eventually at some point we got to actually practice this stuff and that was fun um, but then once everything was done and you actually had some downtime there was nothing to do um, there's nothing there really I mean and it, so you just kind of hung out um, lifted and ate Taco Bell a lot so that was that was Wichita now, being a weapons loader, was that something that you picked and wanted to be, or was that something that was more voluntold? Yeah, voluntold. Yeah, that uh, I wanted to be a um, loadmaster uh, on a C-130. That would have been awesome. Um, but no, that that didn't end up happening. And then even once I found out that you know uh, I was going to be in munitions. Um, I was hoping that I could uh, be, you know, a gunner on a, on a uh, C-130, uh, one of the one of those. But um, apparently, you couldn't transfer over at that point in time. Uh, so, but you know, while I was in basic training, they they did ask me because uh, I I hadn't been in a whole lot of trouble, uh, at least legally, or hadn't got caught enough. So. They asked me while I was in basic training, they're like, hey, you know what, we can get you a top security clearance and you can work with, uh, work on B-52s. Would you like to do that? And this is another one of the pieces of advice I, I completely forgot about till now that my dad told me. He said, if they ever ask you to go to Minot, say no. <laughs> so my, uh, so of course they, they asked me, you know, uh, do you wanna work, work on B-52s? And I, I was like, hmm. Uh, I know what that is. It's a it's a bomber 
Uh, and I, I thought about it for a minute, and I was like, well, wait a minute, where, where are they stationed? You know, where would I be going as my first duty? They're like, Minot. I was like, no. <laughs> no, I would not. So did you have any context as to why not to go there, or just taking your dad at, your, at his word? Um, the, so my uncle, he was in the military, I guess, at one point, and uh, he was stationed there, and it did not go over well there. And, and I've heard, since then, I've heard several stories of just how, uh, I guess it's just depressing. Um, it's just not a very um, fun place. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, if there was an armpit of America, that would be it. Um, real beautiful, from my understanding, from uh, the Dakotas and stuff like that. But um, that's one of the places you want to drive through and, and admire, not really stay. So I don't know. But um, yeah, I I said no, and then um, went to uh, went on to F-16s and worked on those. Uh, so during this time, you're, you're just getting into the military. You got through basic training, going through your tech school. Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything that kind of helped you get through that? Anything that helped with maybe living in the barracks or the PT regimen? Yeah. Um, really, letters letters from my wife helped. Writing letters um, that was that was always nice. She'd she'd spray her perfume on the letters, which just I think that hurt more than helped, actually. It kind of drove me nuts. Uh, but it was, I mean, it was nice. It really was. I liked it. Um, she'd send me pictures, too, which was cool. Uh, but uh, just trying to stay focused. I'd study a lot um, or work out a lot. Um, but, yeah, uh, just trying not to get distracted. Uh, I, I know a lot, like, a lot of people got distracted and go off and do um, things not not saying that I ever didn't get distracted, but uh, for the most parts, you know, I, I tried to stay focused and get out of there as soon as as soon as possible and get back to my wife and get to our first duty because I, I knew it was all temporary. So, uh, so what ab what about after you're done with uh, your training? What, what was your first duty station? Uh, it was Hill Air Force Base, Utah. Well. I should tell you this first. Um, I had orders to um, Japan, um, Okinawa, and really excited about that because that's where me and my wife wanted to go. Uh, but my wife has had medical issues. Uh, she she battled with cancer when she was like 18, and um, so they once they realized that they diverted us to. Hill Air Force Base, Utah. So had the orders. We were really excited. We're going to Okinawa, yay! And then um, there at the end, they were like, mm, "No, nope, we can't really. You know, if something was to happen to your wife, we can't really uh, help her out there. So you're going to Hill Air Force Base." And so that's where uh, my first and only um, station was. Uh, how long were you there? Uh, th three years altogether, I believe. Okay. Around three years. Uh, are there any memories or anything that kind of sticks out during that time that... While I was in uh, at Hill? Yeah, while you were at, oh, yeah. in Utah. Yeah, um, Hill is beautiful. Uh, I remember uh, when we first showed up or when we yeah I think it was more like when we first showed up because we, we took a long trip there I pretty much drove straight there um, and when we when we finally got there and we just saw the mountains it it, it was picturesque I mean it, it literally looks like, looked like somebody took a canvas and, and just dropped it on the horizon it was it was intense with just the mountains and everything and I mean and this was like was it, it was a, I can't remember exactly what time when I got in there um, I want to say it was yeah it was like somewhere in the spring uh, that I arrived at Hill Air Force Base um, and so there you had the snow ca capped mountains and it was warm 
uh, down where we were at. And it was just absolutely beautiful where we showed up. And that's all we talked about. And we were almost distracted. We were like so distracted that it was dangerous. Uh, driving and and yeah it was it was it was really cool but uh, also when I got there uh, trying to figure out who I was sup- supposed to report to um, I had one guy calling me um, telling me you know, it was a fellow airman he I can't remember his name now but he was telling me uh, where to go uh, what to do leading all the way up to the point where I got to Hill Air Force Base then once I got there I couldn't get a hold of him I was like, well, this is pretty convenient. So I'm calling all around. Uh, I only had his personal cell phone number. I didn't actually have a phone number to <clears throat> the uh, the unit or, or the office or anything that I was supposed to go to. So I uh, just called the base, the directory, uh, told them the information that I had on my packet, and they directed me to the flight line. Uh, and it was the, uh, the three three eighty what was he three twenty first, right? Um, so talk to them, and they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, we're expecting you. Come on in." So I go and I report to them, start working with them, and I think it's about a week later, I get a notice that I am a wall. I'm like, "How am I a wall? I'm I'm here." Oh. I know. Uh, sorry, for those who don't know, uh, what does AWOL mean? Uh, that I'm that I haven't reported in. I, I haven't showed up. I'm missing. Absent without leave. Yeah, absent without leave. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So that's what's that. That's the notice. I get this notice that I'm absent without leave, um, and I take it into my flight chief and <laughs> I show it to him. And so he, he traces it back to, you know, exactly where I'm AWOL from. And it turns out I was supposed to go ammo, which is the people that supply the munitions to the loaders. Now, mind you, I've been, I've been training as a loader throughout all the tech school. And ammo is with us there at uh, Shepherd, Shepherd Air Force Base. And there's, there's like this, um, there, there's this, little conflict or whatever between us and ammo because for some reason ammo is really proud about the fact that they can spell ammo and they say it really really loud and if they and then at the end of it they're like if, if you ain't ammo you you ain't excuse my language but you if you ain't ammo you ain't shit is what they say and it's like and you, you hear this because we're marching to class every day uh, and that's what we hear every day and we're like you've got to be kidding me and they, and they think they're all special because they can spell ammo. And it's so irritating. And then uh, working on the flight line, we're always waiting on them. We have to, we have this turnaround. We have so much time to turn around, uh, you know, unload and reload munitions and then get the plane back up in the air. You're waiting on ammo to show up. And you can't figure out why because usually you have to call ahead planes are going to land, call ahead that they're going to land at such and such time. We need whatever munitions by this time. It isn't until like 20, 30, I don't know, whatever, however many, however much time that the plane's already there and you're waiting for them to show up. And then you have to hurry up and work faster in order to get this jet unloaded and loaded, reloaded with munitions. So, Going back to my story, originally, um, I am re- I am missing from ammo. Ammo was expecting me to be there, and I, I look at my flight chief. I'm like, I'm not ammo. I'm a loader. I was trained as a loader. Why in the world would I ever go to ammo? And he's like, Well, you know, once you get out of tech school, technically you could go to one or the other. And he's like, I guess you're supposed to report over there. I was like, well, so am I supposed to go over there? He's like, no, nah, I'm going to I'm gonna keep you over here. And saved me from going to ammo. <laughs> so I stayed flight line that time. But, yeah, that all happened within, like, the first month or so of being there. Wow. Yeah. It was fun. 
So uh, did that kind of set the mood for the rest of your time there, or was that kind of just a hiccup? In, no, in that, that that was that was just one little hiccup. I mean, uh, <clears throat> the for the most part, um, I had a really good time uh, loading and unloading uh, aircrafts. Uh, we. We worked a lot. Uh, we worked many different shifts. Uh, our our hours were dependent on um, whenever the jets were flying. So we, we could be working days one day, uh, or at least one week span. Uh, we could be working a swing shift or a night shift, whatever. Um, we and and that was that would get kind of exhausting at times. Um, there'd be lulls where we would, we'd be on days for a long period, but you know, if we went into whatever status, you know, um, we'd have to, we'd have to, or assimilation, we'd have to switch to nights or, or um, uh, second shift or whatever. Um, so that, that would get kind of irritating or we'd end up going from eight hour shifts to tens, uh, working seven days a week. And that usually happened when um, you know, you'd have somebody that get a DUI or something like that. You'd report in on the weekend. Uh, usually, uh, usually you have to report in on blues. That's the only time we ever wore blues was when um, some colonel wanted to chew us all out. So we'd have to go in, and then we had this one colonel that he just—I think he was amazed by the F word because he just really enunciated it in a special way. He was like. I'm not gonna say it, but I mean, he just would do that, just, and and it was very distracting. I have no idea what he said except for that word. <coughs> I could not tell. And I think he chewed us out for like a good 30 minutes. We stood there at attention, and he just did that. And then we had to go back to our individual flights, and then talk about how you know we're not gonna provide alcohol for minors. We're not gonna um, drink and drive, and all that stuff. And and I don't know what it was about Flightline. I don't know if it's the same for everybody else, but um, it seems like it was almost every weekend we were dealing with that, especially during the summer. Like, it continued to happen like that. But um, I will mention, I think it's, I think it's important to mention, like, right, uh, I was, uh, our deployment was coming up. So we were, we were set to deploy. Uh, when I got there, when I first got there, the guys had just come back from deployment. I had been there for, uh, I think, two two years or a year and a half at this point, and our deployment's coming up. And, you know, they start asking for volunteers at first. You know, anybody want to go? And I'm like, yeah, you know, sign me up. I'm ready to go. And they're like, okay, well, you just have to get your, your 623s done. So I, and that's just your training form. Your, all your training and I'm like cool and I didn't have very much left at that point so I knocked those out and I'm ready to go and it's about a month out from our deployment and I'm out there <clears throat> on the flight line we're just going through and we're changing out um, the jets were air to air at this point so we had, we didn't have a whole lot to do it was simple we, we just had to change out the chaff and flare and then switch out the Argon bottles for the AM9s uh, I think can't remember, but anyways, uh, I know I had to switch out the Argon bottles. So I go out there and to switch out an Argon bottle, there's a little cover and then there's this flathead screw that you just have to open up. And so I go out there, take a screwdriver and go to open it up and then all of a sudden I hear this pop in my wrist. And I'm like, what the heck? And I, I don't think much of it and I just, go like this to try to adjust it and then I hear another pop and then all of a sudden uh, there's raging pain that shoots through my arm and uh, I scream like uh, I mean it was just it was uh, it was really really painful I, I don't know uh, how to describe it except that it was it was enough to make me scream and then it actually brought me to tears which uh, if anybody knows me, I don't really do that. Uh, so they rushed the bread van out to me and uh, snagged me up and took me to um, the emergency room and took x-rays and they're like, well, 
uh, we don't see anything wrong with you. I think you just sprained it. I'm like, I didn't sprain it. Um, I know I'm not a doctor, but I know it takes more than just a screwdriver to sprain my wrist. Uh, there's something wrong with it. The doctor uh, wouldn't listen. Um, it was this was towards the end of the day. Um, they just kind of threw a brace on it and sent me sent me on my way. Uh, about three months later, I'm still having issues just even riding. Like I'm just shaking so bad, and my, my hands still swollen. Um, and I go back to the doctors. Uh, I think at this point it's probably like the second or third time I go back to um, the doctors. And they finally refer me out to uh, a therapist, a uh, physical therapist. Physical therapy looks at it and goes, I'm not touching it. You've, you've messed something up. Uh, then eventually I, they refer me to um, orthopedic, orthopedics and they realize that I tore my cartilage, uh, my TFCC, which is some sort of cartilage in there, and then just about every ligament I had in there. It was all because the my bone, my ulnar bone, was too long. So I uh, I missed I missed my deployment <clears throat> that I was looking to go on, and I'm now stuck with this this brace and, and looking at surgery and everything else for my wrist and. I go from being, you know, this is actually pretty good <clears throat> airman, uh, good loader. I mean, they stuck me with on a team with a, a one man. A one man is a staff sergeant. Uh, I'm an airman. Uh, I think at this point I'm a senior airman, and or no, yeah, because I started off as a A1C and I got senior airman, and then, um, and then there's the other airman that's a um, uh, the three man. But they stuck me on this team, and, and I I was doing really good on this team, and, and they had high expectations for me. And so I went from that to being kind of this broke, um, realistically worthless airman is what it came down to. And uh, kind of make a long story short, a real long story short, uh, after about uh, five surgeries on my wrist, um, they eventually pushed me off into supply where I started working in there and <clears throat> I excelled in there I actually uh, <clears throat> excuse me I, I did pretty good there I uh, started uh, that's where I learned I mean I already had some experience in factories and stuff like that and I started to learn the supply side of things um, got through some really tough um, uh, inspections uh, while while people were deploying I, I was picking up jobs that typically staff sergeants have um, tech sergeants have I was having to do that kind of stuff and um, ended up getting airmen of the quarter uh, while a bunch of people were on deployment but it, it really helped me out because I, I ended up uh, saving the Air Force uh, or at least that's um, that unit quite a uh, that flight quite a bit of money because uh, I found containers filled with all kinds of gear uh, that had just been randomly sitting there and just through my inspections and everything else found this stuff uh, that had been brought back on containers from um, Iraq and just nobody they completely forgot about it and I went through all this stuff and found it through through the processes of uh, what I was supposed to do and we all we did was reissue it back out and saved them all kinds of money so they're really happy about that and, um, yeah I got airmen in the quarter for that wow that doesn't sound like a worthless airman at all right yeah so they were they were happy about that um, and then when I finally uh, got to the point where um, I could use my wrist again uh, I had a weight restriction on how much I could lift which did not work for my career field. So uh, I had to be able to lift over um, over 100 pounds, uh, I believe is what it was. And 
they uh, the doctor said you're you're not going to be able to do that not not with your wrist not anytime in the near future my the acting flight chief that I had at the time me and him did not really get along that well um, and it was it was a lot to do with the fact that I was broke uh, he saw that I was um, he, he viewed me as being worthless and uh, I would joke around with him I, I tried to make it as fun as I could you know uh, one day I I mean he just when he sees me he it would just I could tell it frustrated him because uh, I got put back in the flight now that the brace was off and everything, and it, it just made him mad. So he stuck me on desk duty, and I was doing random desk stuff. But he walks in, and he sees me, and he just shakes his head. And I, he might have been having a bad day already, particularly, uh, and he just didn't want to see me first thing in the morning. But he walks in, and he just sees me, and I could tell already, you know, by body language, he just is already frustrated with me. And I look right at him, and I'm like, Chief, so glad to see you. You know what? I had a dream about you last night. And then that was it. I got pulled into his office and, oh, Lord, he lit me up. Just lit me up. And I walk out of there and I'm like, man, it doesn't matter. And so I started pursuing cross training out of there. Trying to get out of there because it just wasn't, I mean, it wasn't going to work with, between me and him. My flight chief was actually deployed at the time. Him and I got along, but not this acting flight chief. Uh... So I had everything kind of lined up to actually uh, transfer out of there. I was going to go into the guard uh, at that point. And he got wind of it because I think they had to contact him and find out or whatever. I'm not real sure how we got wind of it, but he did. And he goes, you're, you're not, you're not cross training. Uh, he's like, you're, you're done. Um, and I forget what initiated the conversation, but uh, he took my training records and he just proceeded to erase everything that I'd done and, and then tearing out the stuff that uh, applied to, well, the stuff I needed to be able to cross train. So I had to have, um, I had to meet a certain level um, of training to be able to cross train and he just took that out of my records uh, I was then med boarded um, and med boarded me being med boarder was partly my decision uh, because I, at that point I, I, I'd had enough um, I was tired of being a dirtbag airman I wasn't allowed to test for test for staff, and uh, I was I was just done. I was tired of it, and uh, I was so angry, and I just wanted out at that point. So um, they asked me. They're like, "Do you want to keep going? Do you want to try to keep going?" Um, I didn't see any, any real options of me keep going because I I couldn't lift what I needed to in that career field. Uh, that chief was uh, clearly made a statement over the fact that I was not going to be able to go anywhere um, within the Air Force. So I said, I want out. And I got out. That was March of 2004. And how did you feel coming back after going through all that? Coming back to... Coming back to... Or leaving, uh, leaving the military. How did that make you feel? When uh, yeah, I was, I was pissed. Um, I, I wanted nothing to do with the military. Um, fortunately, my dad, he, he's a little more stubborn than I am, and I'm freaking stubborn too. But he, uh, he convinced me to at least register with the VA. Uh, so I registered online. I didn't, I didn't step foot into the VA. Just registered with them. And, and that was after long discussions over a couple of years. Uh, I finally registered with them um, online, but I didn't step foot in the VA. Um, I didn't acknowledge that I was um, a veteran or part of the military. Um, I 
I, I just pretty much uh, tried to erase that that part of who my identity and who I was. I didn't want anything to do with it. And how long did that last? That that, that feeling of that. Um. Probably up till two thousand and. Up to jeez, that's that's tough. Um, I, I mean, there's still aspects of it that I'm letting go of. I mean, like I like now I'm just telling the story, but um, probably not till um, I started school in 2007. Um, I don't know, probably not until I got involved in the BMC, uh, which would have been a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, that I finally started to um, get back into the veteran community and start accepting that I am a veteran, I guess. Now, kind of walk me through how that, like, how did it go to re re-identifying as a veteran? I mean, was there a program or was there anyone that gave you advice or was it just being at a, in a school environment around veterans that hmm. kind of bring that out in you? Yeah. Um, yeah, so when I first started going to school, uh, I know they had like this little VMC center, um, if you want to call it that, they had like a little closet basically. And I had to just go through there and fill out a piece of paperwork and drop it off, and I didn't have to, I didn't have to deal with them any more than that. Um, I was, I did have to deal with the VA. I had to go through them and apply for the the fact that I was a disabled vet. Um, so, what happened with my wrist and a couple other things, the uh, the Air Force deemed as, or the VA deemed as service connected. So, um, I, again, this was all very strongly encouraged through my dad and, and my dad just kind of pushing me uh, to do, to get this stuff done. And, and when I say pushing me, it was, it was kind of like, um, your life's a mess. You're not doing much for your family at this point. You need to get things going. Um, kind of the harsh reality type deal. And so I get registered uh, through, the, through the VA, um, eventually get into the program, uh, Chapter 31, um, and, and, and it was more of like a, okay, I'll just go through the, um, I'll just go through the process. I, I don't really consider myself this, but as long as it gets me to school, whatever. And started going to school. Then one, um, in one year, I like I took a two-year break from school because I was going part time and working part time and or working full time. Uh, then took a break and then I had to come back to school because things weren't working again. Um, had another one of those harsh reality talks. Go back to school, and the VMC is different and now has this like whole location. And I go to drop off my paperwork. I go to do my paperwork, do the same thing, and then all of a sudden, this this guy Adam, um, really cool dude, uh, he was like, uh, "We need to set you up for an appointment." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "Yeah, oh, no, we need to set you up an appointment. Show it to have you tour around, do all this stuff." And I'm like, "I no, 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 I, I don't care about this. I just want to drop off my paperwork and I want to go." And um, he was like, no, no. So I had to go through this this appointment thing, walk through this the, the VMC, and, and see all this stuff for veterans. And and I'm still not considering myself a veteran, so I, I could care less. But um, had to go through the process, convince myself it's just part of the process. And I went through it and then realized how cool it was. Like I was like, man, free printing, computers, all this stuff. I was like, I see some benefits in this that's that would become very useful you know I'd already done some school I know that this would be beneficial to me so I was like okay so I started hanging out there as I was going to school started um, taking um, taking some of those benefits 
uh, or using some of those benefits. Uh, two major ones, coffee, yeah, and uh, printing. Um, and started talking to people, seeing the same people that were in that center in class, and then started having friends, uh, developing relationships from that. And I think what ultimately ended up happening was um, through some shared stories, um, I realized that there, there's more people like me. Um, and that, and, and even those that were different than me, there were some shared experiences. And uh, I started to relate, and I, and I started to realize that, uh, you know, I, I think I am a veteran. Uh, and eventually uh, found um, the program, um, Veteran Voices, and realized that this could be my this could be my service. This could be my way of of completing what I felt was was taken away from me. And so um, through just pure coincidence and, and then also um, I would say just grace from um, <laughs> Jennifer, uh, Jennifer CV and, and, and Dr. Gordon, they, uh, they gave me a job and had me start working. And I kind of threw myself into this whole thing. And I think at first I was probably um, a bit much, a little bit too strong because uh, I just started throwing ideas into it and I'm just like, we gotta do this, 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 this. And they're like, whoa, it, it doesn't quite work like that. And I'm like frustrated at first, and and I, I want I wanted to serve so bad, because uh, because I, I, it just felt like this was this was that for me, um, a way to redeem myself, I guess. And uh, and then you know finally settling into it, and then talking to my first veteran. Uh, that's that I think that's when it, when I felt it. After talking to my first veteran, after hearing his story, um, walking out of there, I, it was almost like I felt high or something like that. I don't know. Um, probably not the most appropriate term, but high of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just I could not believe how rewarding it was for me, um, and kind of felt kind of felt selfish, but. Um, I just, I just realized that, yeah, this, you know, if, if I'm going to do anything with my, with who I am and my identity and, and my life in order to, in order to complete what I felt was, was a part of truly who I am. I need to be in a veteran community. I need to be with vets. And this, these oral histories, talking with veterans, I mean, I already started talking with veterans, but now capturing those and uh, archiving them and, and doing all the things that we do now, um, I now have a purpose with what I'm doing. And it, and it, and it feels so much like the reasons why I joined the military, right? So, wow. yeah. <laughs> so what advice would you give to another veteran who went through a similar situation, like you said, uh, once you started talking to veterans, you found out that you had more in common with them. Uh, what would you say to, to a veteran who just got out similar circumstances, right. got injured, wasn't able to, didn't feel like they fulfilled their full obligation that they wanted to. Yeah. W what would you say to that veteran? <laughs> um, first off, I'd, I'd say I understand. I, I know what it feels like. <laughs> but um, I guess just 
just start talking to veterans just just start talking to other people don't you don't you don't have to go out there and um, try to be something you're not you know I, I, I think a lot of times I I dwelled on the fact that I wasn't the career veteran like my my dad was or or my grandfather was or I wasn't a combat veteran like I intended to be um, I wasn't this or I wasn't that I, not not to dwell on any of that just to start talking with other veterans and listening to them uh, without any further intent but that just to listen to them and you might find some comfort in that alone um, I think that's what helped me the most was once once I finally once I finally got rid of what I should have been and just started talking with other veterans uh, I think that that's kind of what started to turn things around. Uh, well, I only have a couple more questions for you. Sure. Uh, is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or that should be added to this interview? Um, no. I uh, can't really think of Anything else? Uh -uh. Hmm. Now, now here's my favorite question. No. Yeah. Uh, what message would you like to leave for future generations who have viewed this interview? <laughs> um, well, there's, I don't know, I, I kind of like look back on both me and, and my brother and the different paths that we took. Um, I don't, my brother learned from my lessons and, and he, he went a different direction, but I don't discredit anything that he did um, because he's, I mean, he's, he's so extremely successful in what he did and he's working for the government now. And um, here I am, uh, I've served in the military my dad was in the military. My grandfather was in the military. I think, um, I think future generations just, if they were to, I don't know, just look back on my story, they would see um, somebody that, somebody that that really wanted to complete their own plan. Um, but uh, had to had to adapt and develop a new plan, right? Um, and then, so if you, yeah, for for those for those that I guess are are looking, uh, watching this, learning from it, um, learn how to. Uh, Learn how to adapt. Um, learn how to be flexible. Um, and then, military. My experience with the military is not everybody's. It's it's not it's not going to be bad for everybody. There's a lot of awesome stories, um, but it doesn't mean that serving your country means joining the military. Uh, so proud of my brother and his service is just incredible you know the way he went the route he took and he's so successful the, the way he went um, and I love I love how that we all have served in some way so your your service um, can be done in any can be done in any different forms um, so yeah just just taking that into consideration as well just like my service now is through veteran voices right 
Well, uh, this concludes our interview. I just want to say thank you for the taking the time to do this interview, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your service.